playing, when injuries have stolen your game, you'll talk for a living. And you'll even get to sit down for an interview with me, your old friend Feherty. This is a treat for me. I love this old fart. I really do. There are no relationships in our lives that matter more than those we share with our parents. For better or worse, our moms and dads shape us. Our friends and colleagues validate us, but our parents teach us who we are by showing us who they are when we're young and vulnerable. Ken's dad, Fred Venturi, was a high school educated salesman on the San Francisco Embarcadero who tried to inspire Kenny, but he was a very hard man to impress. Throughout his life, Kenny always felt tremendous pressure to impress his old man. He was inspired and maybe a little wounded too until he won the Open in 1964. This is a story of tough love, but Kenny Venturi turned out to be one tough man. Stick around, you'll see. We met Ken Venturi in Los Angeles. After speeding through La La Land traffic for a while, we raced to his favorite old west side eatery, Mateo's. I told everybody you were coming here today and they all canceled their reservations. I see that. Well, Kenny, it's uh, nice to be back in Mateo's, one of your old haunts. Long, long time ago, we was just used to have dinner here a lot of times with Mr. Sinatra and a bunch of the crew and everybody, and brings back old times. Well, speaking of old times, when you won in 64, I know it, it meant a great deal to you, obviously, for a variety of reasons, but one was your father. Was there something that you felt you wanted to prove to your father? Growing up, we were sitting at the dinner table, and, and uh, I, I had won the state amateur and the city amateur and all this stuff, and telling my father how good I was. I was going on and on and ran out of accolades. <laughs> For yourself? Oh, yeah. And he finally said, he said, son, are you through now? I said, yeah, Dad. He said, let me tell you something, son. When you're as good as you are, he says, you can tell everybody. When you get really good, son, they'll tell you. Kenneth Venturi was born in San Francisco, California on May the 15th, 1931. As a boy, he caddied at Harding Park. I was inspired to become a great player in 1946 while watching Byron Nelson win at San Francisco's Olympic Club. Kenny would later establish great friendships with Nelson and Ben Hogan too. After winning three San Francisco City Championships beginning at the age of 17, he nearly won the Masters as an amateur in 1956. After turning pro, he won 14 times on the PGA Tour including the U.S. Open at Congressional in 1964, the same year he was named PGA Player of the Year and the Sports Illustrated Sportsman of the Year. He played on one winning Ryder Cup side and was captain of the winning President's Cup team in 2000. With superstardom in his sights, injuries tragically took away the use of his hands and the career of one of golf's potential greats was cut short after only a decade. We'll never know what might have been, but in 1968, Kenny began an extraordinary 35-year career as the lead golf analyst on CBS. I think it's the greatest feat I've ever known in all sports. Audiences embraced Venturi's knowledge of the game and his wonderful voice. I'll tell you, I've seen it all today. This is unbelievable. At 80 years old, Kenny still loves the game and the beautiful places it's played. Growing up in San Francisco during World War II, you were a Harding Park kid, right? I was 10, 10 years old and I was caddying. I was probably the best caddy. I never lost the ball in all the years I caddied. You know why? Why? I always kept an extra one in my pocket with the same <laughs> number. Oh, here it is, right over here. <laughs> and, and, you know, boy, this guy is good. <laughs> You grew up playing golf. Uh, did you ever think that you'd end up being mentored by people like Byron Nelson and playing with someone like Ben Hogan? It was 46, I think it was, 45, 46. I watched uh, Byron Nelson win the San Francisco Open 
at Olympic Club. And he'd won 11 in a row in 45? Yeah. I came home to my mother and I said, I just saw the greatest golfer in the world. And I want to grow up to be just like him. Never knowing that I'd be taken under the wing by Byron Nelson. You can argue who was the greatest golfer that ever lived, but I think Byron Nelson was the finest gentleman that, that ever played the game. And he was like a second father to me, he was. I said, I want to tell you one thing, Sam. He said, just leave him alone. Don't get him upset. Just let him alone. I had a contract with the New York Yankees when I was 18 years old. To do what? And my father gave me a hug and a kiss. He said, son, it makes no difference if you ever play golf again. I said, how could you say that, Dad? We couldn't talk to Ken Venturi in Los Angeles without making a stop at Bel Air Country Club. This place does not suck. Two things that can happen in this game that can't be done to. A slow player can play with a fast player, but a fast player cannot play with a slow player. And a talkative person can play with a quiet person, but a quiet person can't play with a talkative person. The thing about it, when Hogan and I would play, we had great conversations with no words. He'd hit a great shot, or I'd hit a great shot, and we'd look over and he'd go, what else do you have to say? If you were looking for a time where you might be mentored by iconic players, you could say that the mid-1950s was the mother load. The Depression was over, wars were won, and America was on top of the heap. So were her golfers, and Ken Venturi found himself under the wings of two of the best ever in Ben Hogan and Byron Nelson. Man, Frank, that was a different pair of wings. Oh, sorry. He's a little sensitive about the flying thing. We used to play exhibitions. And Byron Nelson would get on the first tee and ask, what's the course record and who owns it? We got in the car one day and I said, Byron, why do you always ask, what's the course record and who owns it? He says, Ken, I want to tell you something, as long as you're with me. Now, tournaments are different, but you find out what the course record is and who owns it. And if it's held by the head pro, you never break it because he lives there and you're only visiting. <laughs> Byron Nelson taught me that. You played in an era, and I love to, to tell some of your stories when I speak at banquets, uh, but I, I always, you know, A, uh, give you credit or blame you for them depending on which no, one it is. Yeah. Unless they're good or bad. Okay. That's right. Yeah, but, but I'll ask you to tell them whenever we work together. I would say, Kenny, tell them the one about it because I wanted to see their reaction. This was back in the days when golf was in black and white and cigarettes had vitamins in them and you went from one tournament to another with uh, players like Sarazen and Sneed and Hogan. It drove in your cars. The tour would come out of L.A. and uh, Pebble Beach, L.A., then from there to Phoenix, Tucson, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Pensacola. I had to win two tournaments to uh, buy a car in our day. Yeah. You win two tournaments a day, you buy a jet. Was it a better time to play golf, you think, then than it is now? Forget golf. Sports, entertainment, family, handshake, your word. But uh, I had a contract with the New York Yankees when I was 18 years old. I was signed by Lefty O'Doul, and Joe DiMaggio was my tutor. To do what? play center field for the Yankees. And then I was thinking about it, or going full bore, and I won two trips. One to Michigan and one to Boston. I stayed at the Copley Plaza in, in Boston, played Charles River, and I came back and I said to Lefty O'Doul, I said, Lefty, I, I'm quitting baseball. He said, how can you do that? I said, I found out they live a lot better at country clubs than they do at dugouts. <laughs> I gave up baseball completely. Uh, you have to forgive me that question, you know, to do what? I thought maybe they'd hired him as a bartender or something. I had no idea that, that, that you were signed as a baseball player. That's amazing. I wasn't a great hitter, but I, but I, could, I could catch anything that came out there. And, and just to, to think about being tutored by Joe DiMaggio. How, how about you think about times and monies? Joe DiMaggio, the greatest, right? His biggest year was $125,000. Wow. His biggest salary. 
We're talking about then and now. Players arrive at tournaments with a nutritionist, with a trainer, with an entourage. Uh, you, it, how do you feel about that sort of thing? Well, they always ask me, too, about I said, did you ever have a trainer? I said, yeah, I had a trainer all my life on tour. His name was Bud. <laughs> 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 I was taught by Nelson and Ben Hogan. They've been there. They had the gun to their head. Ben Hogan's great line, there are three ways to beat somebody. You outwork them, you outthink them, and then you intimidate them. Yeah. That's part of the game, and I loved it. In fact, when we would do exhibitions, and when we get in the car, Byron and I, and he said, oh, okay, now tell me what you were thinking on the first hole when you hit the iron arrow. Or this, no, this is what you've got to be thinking there. This is what you do. I was always thinking about what I wanted to do before I got to the ball. And when I got to the ball, all I had to do, I knew what I was going to do. I only had to pick out the club. That's all there was. I'm going to blow your mind with some stats right here. When I won the Open, I was number one in driving accuracy. Not bad, because the yeah. rough was huge. The rough was long. And now I was 16th in overall driving length. Not bad, right? 16? Yeah. 249. They're hitting five irons 249 today. That's how different things have changed. The golf, I mean, when you think about it, you can't compare who, well, who's better, who's it. These kids today, or our air against Bobby Jones with Hickory Shaft, yeah. Gene Harrison, Francis we met. I mean, it's a... It's, it's golf, but it's a different game. One of the great moments in Ken Venturi's golfing life was the legendary amateur versus pro match at Cypress Point, featuring him and Harvey Ward against Venturi's idols, Dan Hogan and Byron Nelson. I remember it like it was yesterday. Every shot. I can remember how it started. We were at George Coleman's house, and, and they asked me, you know, what are you two kids going to do tomorrow? I said, I don't know. I said, he said, where do you like to do it? I said, I'd like to play against those two guys. The match was more than a little wager between two Bay Area millionaires, Eddie Lowry and George Coleman. It was a social experiment. They wanted to find out if the country's two best amateurs had a chance against two of the best professionals in the world. Hogan said, we'll play at 10 o'clock. And Coleman says, well, you got a starting time at Pebble Beach at 11. He said, don't cancel that. He says, keep that, because I don't want a bunch of people coming out and around and watching me play against a couple amateurs. Looks over at me and gives me the wink, and I can tell you to terrific <laughs> the whole thing. So we went off at 10 o'clock, and there was no, no gallery there at Cyprus. We went off, and once you get off the first hole at first tee at Cyprus, you don't even see anything except when you get to 14 with a 17-mile drive. And then they started getting the gallery. We're one down going to 15. Hogan makes birdie. Harvey and Byron already made par, and, and I knocked it in on top of them to have them with a two. Oddly enough, Byron and Harvey made two at 16, which you know how hard that is, Whoa. and they both birdied 17. And we get to 18, and Hogan was pretty tight in there, and I made my putt. So Byron says, okay, Ben, knock this in. He says, and we can beat these two kids. I'm right about over here, and he's walking by me. <laughs> and he turns to Byron, and he says, you bet I'll knock it in. I'm not about to be tied by two amateurs. And he walks by me, looks over me, goes, gives me the wink. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, knock it in. If it ended any other way, it wouldn't be the same. In the years since the match, which was exhaustively detailed in a great read from Mark Frost, many questions have been asked about that special but largely undocumented day in golf history. No one can doubt what I have to say about that book. Yeah. You know why? I'm the only one alive, Lynn, the book. <laughs> everybody, the gallery, the, the gallery, everybody at the party, everybody at Coleman's house, everybody at the match, the caddies, they're all, they're all gone. My hands turned the color of this tablecloth. Was it carpal tunnel syndrome to start off with? Look at that swing. I like to swing like that again, but I swung like it once, so it's, it's good enough. 35 years. It's unbelievable. I think his goodbye was the greatest goodbye in the history of television. What's the greatest lesson that Nelson ever gave you? I said, that's simple. He said, Ken, there are times you you got to go 
make the ball go left to right. And there are times you got to make it go right to left. But there'll be times you can't make up your mind. So just hit it straight. <laughs> oh, Byron, thank you for that wonderful lesson. <laughs> Rocket science. <laughs> I don't know, but this, who's that? Yeah, look at that swing. I like to swing like that again, but I swung like it once, so it's it's good enough. That's my bag tag there, number 43 yeah. there, and the ball that, that I won, a little different than the ones they have today, and my, yeah. my player's badge, and then there's a dime. That Is that I, your marker? That I, that I marked the ball with. What I used to do, and I always did, I marked it with heads up. Yeah. If I had to move it, I had tails up. And if I saw tails, that reminded me I have to move it back. For golfers of every era, winning majors is the yardstick upon which they have always been measured. Although his career was shortened by injury, Ken Venturi had several chances to win majors before 1964, but frustratingly, he'd failed to close the deal. After the first 18 holes of a two-round final day at the 64 Congressional U.S. Open, he was two shots behind the man he shared a foxhole with in Korea, his great friend Tommy Jacobs. Under a blistering sun with 18 holes to play, a dehydrated and disoriented Ken Venturi almost let another major get away. Almost. Dr. Everett laid me on the floor and he said, I recommend you don't go out there. It could be fatal. I would looked up at him. And I said, it's better than the way I've been living. And I got up. I don't remember walking to the first tee. My open victory was best described by a man named Joey Lewis. I walked into Toot Shores restaurant on, on that night after it. And Joey came over and greeted me. I got a standing ovation. And then Toot said, I never saw a standing ovation. And every athlete in the world went into Toot Shores on 52nd Street. But Joey Lewis summed up my open victory better than anybody. He said to me, Venny. I saw you win the Open. I saw you stagger, fall, and pass out and couldn't make it off the green. I got to tell you from the bottom of my heart, it's the greatest act I ever saw in my life. <laughs> Let me put it like you're laughing now, so now I can do my speech. <laughs> but up. it's a true story. I, I, it, unbelievable. It was so funny. You were Joe Namath, but on a golf course? <laughs> People don't realize that your career really spanned just about a decade, not much longer. No because of the problems that you have with your hands? Yeah, yes. What was the first sign that there was something wrong with your hands? Was it carpal tunnel syndrome to start off with? I was playing in the World Match Play Championship in England. I got playing and I had no feeling in my hands. My hands turned the color of this tablecloth. It was white, I had no feeling. And that's, I knew I had it. And I went to Mayo Clinic to get it done. They cut too deep on one hand and uh, on my right hand and scars grew around the median nerve and I started getting atrophy, the whole thing. And then I went to Dr. Hoyt in Akron, Ohio, and he rebuilt me a new hand. He built me, he did surgery and everything. And I came back, I won again. I won the San Francisco Open. On the golf course, I played my first round of golf. At home? At the end of that year, it started going bad again. Dr. Hoyt said, I may lose these three fingers and I may never play golf again. And my father gave me a hug and a kiss, looked at me right close to my face. He said, son, it makes no difference if you ever play golf again. I said, how could you say that, Dad? He says, because, son, you were the best I ever saw. And I went back to Dr. Hoyt. I said, do what you have to do, doctor. My father told me I was good. Ben, I need a forward so bad. And the one you don't want, can I have the other one? If I say the one I like, I'm not going to get it. If I had won as an amateur, I would have been the chairman of the Augusta National. Kenny grew up a stutterer, but like every other obstacle in his life, he overcame it and became the best analyst of his and several other people's eras. Before retiring in 2002, he'd been teamed with Jim Nance at CBS for 17 years. 
there was just so much pride in everything Kenny would do. His presentation, his wardrobe, dapper as can be, spot on. Every word he had on the air was measured and thought out. There wasn't anything extraneous there. It was the good stuff. Who's the greatest golfer that ever lived? Nicholas was the greatest winner of all time. Hogan was the greatest course manager of all. Sam Snee was the most aesthetic. And Byron Nelson was the purest striker of the golf ball that any man ever laid. No one hit it straighter than this man. In fact, one year that he shot 30 on the back nine at the Masters, he missed the bunkers a little bit in here and there. One writer said to him, well, you were very lucky today on the course. He says, yes, the more I practice, the luckier I get. It was Hogan that said that? Hogan said that. Ben and I, were, were, we played all the time. He said, you'll always play with me. I can remember at Augusta on the 13th hole on Wednesday, we always, you, you would play the back nine, just he and I, nobody else. Yeah. We got to the 13th hole. He had two forwards. He said, I got these two forwards. I can't make up my mind which forward I want. I'm looking at him, and I said, uh, well, Ben, I need a forward so bad. And the one you don't want, can I have the other one? He said, sure. Which forward do you like? Now, I know, I know if I say the one I like, I'm not going to get it. <laughs> so I said to him, I like, I like this one. So I said, oh, this is the one I want. He says, me too. You can have this one. <laughs> so later on, I told him the story. <laughs> Time after that. He, and Ben's great line was, I don't care, I still got the best one. I said, of course, course you did, Ben, of course. Augusta National is such a special place for you. You know, you played there 16 times. You, you did the broadcast 33 times. It, it, it's just such a special place and carries you know, memories on, on either side of the spectrum for you. What, what, is, what is so special about Augusta? Funny, I got back into the Masters in 56 because I was voted in by the past Masters champion. Because I played in 54, and I made the cut to play in 55, but I was shipped overseas. Right. And it was Ben Hogan at, at the meeting, the dinners, he said, we got to vote in Ken Venturi. And he said, well, why is that? He said, he qualified in 54, couldn't play in 55 in the service, and I got to play in the Masters in 56, because I was voted in by the Masters champion. They had one vote to get one person in. And Ben Hogan was responsible for putting me in the Masters in 56. That is so cool. Huh? Isn't that any good? Yeah. And you know, it was windy on the final day. How bad the weather was. I shot 75 in the third round and was still leading by four. Hmm. So they came to me and they said, you can pick anybody you want. And I said, well, I've been played with Hogan and tutored by Byron. I'd like to play with Sam Snead. And they said, you sure? He said, sure. I shot 80, but I three-putted uh, six times. And, and uh, Jackie Burke won by a shot, and he was the only player in the field to shoot 71 that day. The wind was just ridiculous. Bobby Jones told me if I had won as an amateur, I would have been the chairman of the Augusta National. And Billy Ford said, you would have come with me to... Detroit and you would have been a vice president so you maintained your amateur standing and Whoa. that's how it's that, that, that's something that nobody really under, knows or understands but I would have still been amateur today it wouldn't have been television it wouldn't have been an open they wouldn't have, I mean fate does have a way of bending the twig I guess it does it almost broke that twig I want you to tell me one of my <laughs> personal favorites because it, it kind of defines who you, who you've always been was maybe the mid second or third time that you ever played with Sam Snead? I came right out of the shoot in 57 and I won St. Paul and the next week was Milwaukee and in the last round I was uh, leading by five shots and I was paired with Sam Snead. We go through the first eight holes I'm even par and Sam is four under so I'm only leading Sam now by one shot and we're walking to the ninth hole, which is a pretty good walk. And he's walking next to me. And he leans over to me and he says, Hey, boy, you ain't choking again, are you? I didn't even look at him and I said, I'll show you choking. Well, the next 
eight holes, I played it five under. And we get to the 18th hole, I'm leading by five shots. Mm -hmm. I'm about 15 feet above the hole, and Sam is only about eight, 10 feet below the hole. And I put by about, oh, three feet. Oh, I know. You'll mark the ball and let the other person play, right? Usually. I said, excuse me, uh, Sam, I'll just get this out of your way. And I stepped across his line, and I shake the hook back in the hole. And he misses his putt. We're going in, and he says, I want to tell you something, boy. You cost me second place by myself by missing my putt. And he said, don't you ever do that again. I said, Sam, remember going to the ninth hole when you said when I lost the four shots to you, hey, boy, you ain't choking again? <laughs> I said, I want to tell you one thing, Sam. Don't ever screw with me again. <laughs> and Sam was my biggest fan. For, from those days on, he said, just leave him alone. Don't get him upset. Just let him alone. <laughs> and that'll be like Ricky Fowler saying that to uh, Phil Mickelson. At least our politicians know that, uh, that we know that they're full of crap. I'm sick and tired of you saying nice drive, Francis. We get up to the ball and you're a hundred yards ahead of me. You want me to sing you a few songs? <laughs> If you can't get enough Faherty and you'd like to spend even more time with me, you're probably a cyber stalker. But go to golfchannel.com anyway. <laughs>
He said, you, Mr. Sinatra, last week. <laughs> <laughs> we drive, he drops me off. I go to my house. About 45 minutes later, an hour later, the phone rings. Mr. Kennedy said, I can't sleep. I said, well, do, do, take a sleeping pillow. Just put some music on it. He said, no, he said, I can't sleep. He said, let's go to New York. I'll pick you up in a, in a half an hour. That was a Thursday night, picks me up, Jilly, Pat Henry, Francis and myself, we, we leave on his jet, we go to New York on Thursday night and we come back on Monday. And I don't know if we, I don't know if we got any sleep or anything or not, <laughs> but that's the way we went. And uh, it wasn't just him, it was the rest of the Rat Pack too. I mean, th those were uh, extraordinary times. Well, Dean Martin was, uh, Dean Martin was uh, my partner in the Crosby. Dean was a good player, and he, but you know, they, uh, Crosby, we never had to worry about handicaps. Bob Rosberg and myself and a few of us uh, would say, well, so-and-so is not playing that well. He, he should have a, another stroke or two, or uh, the pro is not doing well. He, he, the amateur should have a couple more strokes. Because what happened is that if you had came in with a phony handicap and won, you were never invited back, and everybody wanted to play it. Never invited back could be a euphemism for something as well, because you hung out not just I mean, with Frank Sinatra, but I, I've been with you with some of your old friends, Chicago cops, and there are people involved with a mob, and you know, <laughs> or I mean, it, it's just, a, it's a movie. Somebody could make a movie of this. I mean, they might disappear if they showed up mm -hmm. with a bogus handicap, these people. Well, certain places, maybe so, but not the Crosby, but some other yeah. place, you know, there's, is that the thing about it, what you say here stays here. I never, I never tell us. I know I've, I see books and things about people that I've known and people write books about them. They never even knew them. Yours became one of the most comfortable voices. And Shakinian pushed the button down and said, anybody opens their mouth or fired. Can you ever get the feeling that you're being listened to. Nothing worse than your wife, you know, trying to... Kathleen, come on in. Before she gets here, I gotta tell you one thing. <laughs> what? She's one of the very few that listens. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Hello darling. darling. Hi, darling. How are you? I'm good. I'd get up, but I can't. No, don't get up. Don't get right. up. Sit, sit, sit. How'd you <laughs> like that? It was wonderful. You did great. Thank you. You did wonderful. Thank you, darling. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is a love story right uh -huh. here. I love them both. <laughs> <laughs> This is, well, the 50-year anniversary of your first appearance at the Crosby. Tell everybody how that happened. Well, uh, I, I watched Byron Nelson win here in 51, and then I won the state amateur in uh, September of 51, and I'm in class. It's uh, 1952, and I'm in class, and they come get me in class, and they say, you, you've got a phone call. I said, well, so what? They said, well, it, it's Bing Crosby. I said, <laughs> Bing Crosby, sure. They said, we really think it's Bing Crosby. So I went up and I picked up the phone. I said, hello. Hey, Ken, it's Bing Crosby. I said, hey, Mr. Crosby, what can I do for you? <laughs> he said, well, we lost one of our amateurs, and I hate to call you at this late time, but could you come down, could you fill in and play in my tournament? I said, I sure will, Mr. Crosby. He says, where are you going to stay? I said, well, I'll find some place. He says, everything is taken. He said, you know where I live on the 13th hole? I said, sure do. He says, you stay with me. Kenny, you had a lot of fun in the air in your time. There was one incident I remember you telling me about at Pebble Beach. Oh, jeez. When Phil Harris joined you, he would do it every year, and Pat Summerall at 18. Oh, I'm going to have to say it the way it is because of course it, you do. It, it, it wouldn't work out. You told me about this to do it. I did. This so, is my fault. So I'm going to blame you. <laughs> so we're talking about this shot at 18 and about the wedge that has to be done, which way they have to hit this shot, and Phil gets up and comes over, he said, I'll be right back. I gotta take a piss. <laughs> We're totally live. This is live. So I go in and, and I said, and remember this, Pat, th I, this is not an easy shot. And right now, in the position he's in, he cannot afford a miss. <laughs> Phil, he just came back and sat down and everything was fine. 
So you made a kick save and a beauty for the voice of Baloo the Bear? <laughs> I want to thank you, Bing, for having me at your tournament. And with this fine array of both amateurs and uh, professionals, I think your 20th clam bake is going to be very outstanding. It looks very large. The weather's dry, and that makes me thirsty. You want to see this shot? Bing Crosby calls me, and he says, Ken, i got to give you a great line, Phil Harris. We're going through Tennessee, and we're going by the Jack Daniels plant. It's 10 o'clock at night. And all the lights are on. And he said, I turned to Phil and I said, well, looks like, Phil, you can't drink them dry. And he said, Phil turned to me and says, yeah, but I got them working nights. <laughs> he, <laughs> Crosby loved that story. He loved to tell that story. He just thought that was the best. Just wonderful people. I was hung over one morning. Oh, no. no. Uh, First time? Yeah, I know. Oh, my. Uh, at Medina. We were playing the PGA Championship, and I'd been with you the, the night before, and you should have been hung over, but as usual, you showed up, navy blue blazer, <laughs> gray slacks, silk tie on, looking all shaved, and you know, and I'm looking at my breakfast, feeling sick, and you said to me, what's wrong with you? I said, oh, Kenny, give me a break. You know, I'm hung over. I said, don't be such a, honestly, I'll tell you a story about a hangover, and you told me a story about a match that you played with Bing Crosby, Bill Worthing, Senator Barry Goldwater at Phoenix Country Club. We get on the first hole, and Barry's got a, a putt of about, oh, 30, 40 feet. And as he's getting ready, he looks up and a dog runs across the green and he puts the ball. <laughs> and Crosby said, didn't you see that dog run across the green? And Barry goes, was that a real dog? <laughs> I said, now there's a hangover. Yes. <laughs> I guess there's nothing more to do now than just watch. And Shakinian pushed the button down and said, anybody opens their mouth or fired. It's been a long time. We were there in the tower watching players you know, exit the green, looking up with the tip of the cap. It was just so emotional. <laughs> We were there in the tower watching players exit the green, looking up with the tip of the cap, a nod to Kenny. I mean, it was just so emotional. It's been a long time. 35 years. It's unbelievable. I think his goodbye was the greatest goodbye in the history of television. The greatest reward in life is to be remembered. And thank you for remembering me. May God bless you. And may God bless America. You were 35 years in the same seat for the same network. It was an extraordinary run that you had with Pat Summerall, with Jim Nance, Jack Whitaker. Uh, I mean, you worked with Henry Longhurst, some of the legends, legendary voices. And yours became one of the most comfortable voices. You know, you told me once that uh, you, you felt that you'd put more people to sleep on a Sunday afternoon than... Uh, uh, well, <laughs> Kathleen, my wife, we, she's been with me at times when I'd been on airplanes and we'd be talking and someone come by, excuse me, are you Ken Venturi? I said, yes. He said, I told my wife, I knew that voice. I knew that voice. What did I say? I would be surprised if he left it short. If that was hit, that is in the middle of the hole. Watch this again. You look like it's losing speed and it's going to go. It's moving to the right. And then look at this. It comes back to the left. I never expected both of them to two fight. Talk about Henry Longhurst, Remembrance of the Masters. Mark O'Meara got about like an 18-footer at the 18th hole to win the tournament. And they asked me, well, what do you think about this putt? They said, Jimmy, I'll tell you something. He's probably hit this putt a hundred times before. He knows exactly what it does. And I'll tell you what, if he makes it, He's the Masters champion. If not, we go into sudden death. And quoting from the great Henry Longhurst, I guess there's nothing more to do now than just watch. <laughs> and Shakinian pushed the button down and said, anybody opens their mouth or fired. The applause, the hugs, the excitement, 
what are you going to say? Well, 97 was my first broadcast at the Masters, and of course, Tiger, you know, won by a, a phenomenal margin after going out in 40. What is it about the place that, uh, you know, Tiger and Phil are the two that we think about today that always should have the best chance you know, of winning there? Well, they got length. They have a magnificent short game. And both of them are wonderful putters. If you can't putt, you better find yourself another game. This, that's for sure, no matter how good you may be. But, uh, but they both can hit the ball high, and they can move it left to right and right to left. They can't curve it as much as we used to in our day. Our ball, it, hell, I can knock it around a corner, you know. Yeah. Now, I play golf today. I aim at pins. I, I can't maneuver it with the balls they have today. It doesn't curve. Goes too straight. Oh, yeah. Your injury basically ended your career. Tiger struggling with an injury to his left knee, you know, that we're, we're led to believe is okay. That left knee is a real bad one for a right-handed player, right? The left knee is bad if you are left hip spinning and straightening. Hogan would go back and his hips would go lateral this way. Yeah. The ones that have the bad knees, the hips are turning here and the left knee is straightened and the right knee is going out. You must be more this way laterally in golf shots. And that's the old, that's the, well, Byron Nelson was the best. You've been one of my dearest friends. I, I love you. You're the grumpy old man. <laughs> that, that you've never changed, never changed. Is there anything, you know, that you would change about your time on this earth? I thank God for all the blessings he's given me, and I wouldn't change a thing. And I'll tell you another thing. I wouldn't give up your friendship for anything in the world. You're as good a friend as I have ever had in my life. <laughs> Kenny, well, thank my you. mom and dad would be proud of me. Thank you. That good. I am able to shake your hand. Thank you, my friend. <laughs> We just spent an hour with one of the greatest men who ever played or talked about the game of golf. I can't help but wonder how his career might have gone had his hands not failed him after his decade-long career. But everything happens for a reason, and Kenny got one of the great gifts of his life when his father finally acknowledged his accomplishments. You know, as I recall, his middle finger always worked perfectly. Who knows what would have happened if Kenny had stayed healthy and he'd gone on to win ten majors? But it's an ill wind that blows nobody good. And Kenny's misfortune on the golf course became all of our good fortunes. It was a gift for him and for all of us who listened. Thank you, Kenny. And thank you, Kathleen, for looking after that old goat. He's missed and loved by millions. I'm just one of them. Watermelon! It upset a lot of people. I don't know if upset is the word I use. I think I surprised a lot of people and they were nervous about the whole thing. Please welcome. Attica Sorenstab! We're men, we don't want to get beaten by a girl. Are you good at chopping? They said I was one of the greatest choppers they'd ever seen. I turned to Mike and I said, he's coming out. I recommend we name him Will. Annika, do I have any pond weed hanging out of my nose? It's a fuse. There. Well, it's Twitter time. Join in the conversation. And do me a favor, if you find out what I'm thinking, let me know. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Good night, sweetie.